uh, to this East West Railway Company online session with your neighboring uh, parishes and councillors along the north of Bedford. Uh, my name is Jordi Vesquich and I'm one of the engagement managers uh, here at EWR Co. Uh, we're pleased that uh, you can join us to the second meeting uh, following the one that we held back in April on the first week of consultation. And as advice on the invitation, the, the session today is, is really an opportunity for you to raise any outstanding questions that you or your residents might have uh, on our proposals now that you've had a chance to engage with um, the consultation documents and, and we're seeing uh, residents will have been in touch with you. Um, and, and overall, we want to ensure that we've tackled your key questions before uh, you submit your responses to the, to the consultation. Um, ahead of today's session, we ask you to, to let us know if there were any uh, questions or issues that uh, you wanted us to, to, uh, to address uh, during this session. Um, thank you very much for those who've written to us. If you haven't, don't worry, we, we have allocated plenty of time for Q&As uh, during this session, so you, you uh, have uh, more than uh, one opportunity for sure to, to raise questions. Um, to let you know as well that we're holding similar sessions um, like the one tonight uh, with all the parishes and councillors along uh, within the consultation zone between Oxford and Cambridge uh, throughout the week. And uh, in terms of the structure of the session, so we'll start with a brief presentation um, uh, that will run for around uh, 30 minutes to basically recap on, on what it is that we are uh, uh, proposing in your area, as well as covering some of the key questions that have been coming up, uh, not only from you, but also from, from public uh, webinars, live chats, correspondence that refer to, to your area. Then we'll move on to a Q&A for which we have allocated uh, 45 to 50 minutes uh, before we wrap up with some uh, next steps. So overall, the, the session should last for around uh, 90 minutes. Um, I'm tonight joined with a, a bunch of my colleagues who will introduce themselves in a, in a second as soon as they, they start talking, as well as a couple of colleagues from, from ACOM and Barley who are supporting us uh, with, with the session as well, with a note taking and, and, uh, and the chat. Um, but before we, we start the presentation, I'm just going to quickly run you through uh, some uh, housekeeping and, and some etiquette uh, for tonight. Um, by now, I'm sure that many of you are, are familiar with the platform that we're using, but just as a reminder, you'll find in the bar below uh, different features, including like the buttons to mute, then unmute yourself, uh, sharing your camera, open the, opening the chat window, or, or checking the list of participants. Uh, we would be grateful if you could rename your, your username uh, in case that your Zoom account doesn't have your, your full name already. Uh, we're also going to ask you to please keep yourself uh, muted at all times unless you're given the, the floor during the Q&A to avoid those kind of like uncomfortable um, sort of echoes or, or weird noises coming through. Um, if you experience any technical issues during the meeting, please email contact at eastwestrail.co.uk. We will be monitoring the inbox and, and we will try to kind of bring you back in or, or kind of help you with any issues that you might be experiencing. Um, in the Q&A section, uh, we will aim to address um, your questions, all the questions that you raise, um, but if, if we run out of time or, or we're not able to, to tackle it tonight, we would take it away and then follow up by email afterwards. And um, we, we will ask you to hold your questions until we, we reach the, the Q and A's. We believe that like the presentation will address um, some of those. Um, but then when, when we reach the, the Q and A part of the, of the session, uh, we'll open the floor um, and we will be more than happy to kind of like give you the mic. So if you want to speak, please indicate uh, so by uh, pre pressing the, the raise your hand button, which uh, you can find in either within the reactions button at the at the bottom, or if not, um, in the bottom right of the participants list, depending on which version of Zoom do you have. Uh, also to let you know that the session um, tonight is being recorded and together with the deck that we're presenting is going to be made available um, on our website next week. And uh, before I hand over to Will, just very quickly, um, if we can move on to the next slide, uh, these are the list of, of parishes, just to let you know who, who we are joined with uh, tonight, the, the list of parishes that we have invited to, to today's session, and as well as if we move on to the next slide, the, the list of uh, wards and the respective councillors. Um, so on that note, I'm going to hand it over to Will. Um, who will uh, begin the presentation. 
uh, I'll take myself off and mute. That would be that would be a start. Uh, thank you very much, Geordie. So as as Geordie has said, um, we'll begin today with a very brief recap of what we're consulting on. We will then go through a series of questions and answers based upon uh, you know the what you've emailed into us and also the sort of um, frequently asked questions that are sort of coming in uh, through our ongoing engagement. Um, also, uh, you know, just a, a sort of reminder of how communities uh, that you represent can get involved and then leaving plenty of time, in fact, the majority of the time today for uh, Q&A. So if we skip on to the next slide, um, you're all aware we're in the middle of a non-statutory public consultation that will be drawing to a close on the 9th of June. And onto the next slide, again, most of you will be familiar with the fact that we are, you know, in this 10 week cons consultation, covering both the customer experience and railway operations and um, aspects of the service that we're here to provide, um, as well as the infrastructure that is necessary to enable that, um, including, you know, proposals all the way from Oxford through to Cambridge. But I imagine the, you know, the particular focus of tonight's discussion will be both uh, you know, in the interventions through Bedford and particularly then from Clapham Green um, towards the East Coast main line. So as we, as we move on to the next slide, um, again, just to remind people of the consultation zone, um, which is the shaded area um, and all those people living within the uh, shaded area will have received summary documents from us um, and we will, you know, we're doing everything we can to promote the uh, the consultation so that people do engage. We are seeing you know, really encouraging numbers of people uh, attending the virtual consultation rooms um, and contacting us via phone, via our uh, live chat events, um, and and also sort of through sort of regular correspondence as well. Um, so as we move on. Um, to the next slide. Uh, again, just quickly to reflect on the customer experience and railway operations, we think it really is important that we hear from people about the type of service that they're expecting from the railway. Of course, there's a lot of focus, and you rightly so, on the infrastructure that we are building and the impact that that will have in the, in the area. Um, and we recognize that people will be very interested in that. Um, but we do want to hear from people about the customer experience and the type of service that they want to make sure we are developing that in parallel, um, not just at the station or on board, but you know, on the board the train, but, but also across that whole end-to-end -end journey. As we, as we move on to the next slide, you know, our research has shown us that there are sort of five key areas um, that people sort of most often you know, are interested in, uh, and, and we're keen to hear your feedback in these. Um, particular areas as well. Um, in terms of the train service, you know, it's sort of timetabling and um, those sorts of things. Also at stations, on board the train, the interaction with our teams, um, and also that all important customer information, making sure people are getting the information that they need via the media that they want at the time that they need it. So again, uh, definitely keen to get people's feedback on those things so that as, as we develop the infrastructure, we in parallel are developing plans for the railway operations and the customer experience. And we want to make sure you know, we're, we're meeting the needs of, of, of the local communities. So as we move on to the, on to the next slide, um, this just gives you a sense of the full suite of infrastructure, geography in terms of where we're consulting. And as I say today, a particular focus um, in the red and particularly the mustard box to the um, to the west of the east coast uh, main line, uh, but there are, as you see, a full suite of full suite of uh, interventions you know across the full Oxford Cambridge geography. As we move on to the next slide, first section uh, section C, looking at Bedford. This was the red box on the slide, and I'll just quickly take you through the uh, the interventions here. So, um, you know, a, a new alignment coming into Bedford, 
uh, coming off the Marston Vale line um, with two potential new uh, locations for Bedford St John's, either moving it closer to the hospital or to a location more to the southwest. Uh, you can see the two purple shaded areas. Then coming through into Bedford Station uh, with two new tracks uh, and the uh, need to uh, you know, demolish and build a new station building uh, serving uh, Bedford uh, Town Centre. Then continuing with that, two new set of tracks uh, through the Bromham Road Bridge um, and up, uh, you know, recognising that that does mean north of the Bromham Road Bridge, uh, we will need to, you know, on the basis of these proposals, uh, demolish um, houses in the Poets area. Uh, and we're obviously working very closely with the local councillors and the uh, property owners uh, there um, before continuing up the Midland uh, main line and then heading eastwards um, across the Paula Radcliffe Way and then onto uh, the alignment options uh, that we have heading towards uh, Cambridge. So as we move on to the next slide, um, you know, we are, we do there sort of zoom in a little bit on the, on the sort of details, you know, sort of north of the, um, north of the Bromham Road Bridge and how that works across the, um, you know, across the sort of uh, Paula Radcliffe Way. And no doubt we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in, in, in more detail as, as we get into the Q&A. Um, you know, I think it is, you know, it is worth noting that we, we, we have drawn the conclusion that it is necessary to put the two new tracks to the east of the existing railway. Uh, you know, from the Bromham Road Bridge as far as the, for the UK Power Network's uh, substation. And that really is to do with the amount of capacity that is available on the Marston, on the Midland Main Line um, and the so, sort of substantial growth uh, in usage there. Um, and, and the fact that this is now a piece of congested infrastructure. As we move on to the next slide, uh, then looking at the alignments and the series of alignments that run across to uh, a, a station on the East Coast Main Line, um, either in the Tempsford area or in the St. Neots area. And you can see that for those station, for those uh, alignments that serve a Tempsford, um, having left the north of Bedford, um, we take the more southerly, so the uh, yellow and purple um, route. Uh, and if we are heading towards St. Neots South, um, we take the more northerly, so that's the red and the dark and light blue routes towards St. Neots. Um, from there, you'll be aware that we then head across to serve either Camborne North Station or Camborne South before heading south into Cambridge. Um, recognizing that um, in relation to the station location at Camborne, we, we are expressing an emerging preference for alignments that go to Camborne North, uh, but obviously in the area that we're particularly focusing in on today, both because both Tempsford and St. Neots South, you know, we haven't expressed an emerging preference, then the, the, the sort of two alignments heading from Bedford across to the Midland main, to the East Coast main line. Um, there isn't yet an emerging preference between those two. Um, again, just so, just so people are aware on that. If we move on to the next slide, you know, we have, as we've said, these are the five shortlisted options. And I think I've talked through those and, and where the emerging preferences are. So in terms of, now picking up, you know, having given you that sort of short summary of the of the proposals in terms of the sort of the frequently asked questions or the questions that you've sent into us, um, we will we'll we'll begin to answer those from the team before opening up to the full Q and A after after that. So if we move on to the onto the next slide, in terms of route options and route alignment options, 
I think I'm hand, am I handing over to Paul on this one? Yes, correct. Yes, thank you, Will. So uh, my name is Paul Sparrow. I am a program manager with the Connection Stage 3 team. So looking at the, the bit between Bedford and Cambridge. Um, I'll just run through some of the questions that we have received over the last few weeks during the consultation and, and just to update a few answers um, so that people can be a bit clearer as to why we are where we are. Um, so the first question here is, um, if you are aligning with the road developments like the A428 further east, then why don't you follow the A421 uh, to Black Cat? Um, fundamentally, the basis of this question is talking about the difference between, uh, in essence, Route B and Route E uh, at the previous stage of the project. Um, and really, uh, the, the concept of following roads like we do with the uh, alignment options that do follow the A428 further east is, it's, it's not about just following a road for the sake of following a road. It needs to be uh, followed only when it, it provides an, a, a benefit to the railway um, and for the locations in which we need to get to. So our analysis on Route B versus Route E was uh, conducted in the previous stage of the project. And it was found that, um, that actually going uh, via Bedford Midland was more beneficial than, uh, than heading towards the east from a Wixons or a Bedford South location. I think the other thing that should be noted here as well is on the Marston Vale line uh, options, so Marston Vale option one and two, there, uh, there is still going to be, a, or it's proposed that there would still be a, a station south of Bedford, be it the existing Kempston Hardwick station or a station that moves uh, closer to the north of the, Stuart, the old Stuartby site. So as a result, we, we actually will have a station south of Bedford and we'll be able to provide the benefits that are required to South of Bedford, whilst also providing the benefits to, and the catalyst to the potential regeneration or the redevelopment around Bedford Midland Station. Um, and I think that's important to understand. Uh, so moving on to the next question, why in route alignments one, two, and six, are you running so close to Wilden High Street, impacting the whole village when you could go 50 meters further north and it would be much better for the village and you wouldn't need to CPO so many houses or be close, uh, so close to them? Um, uh, this is a, a good question. Thank you very much uh, for it. Um, at present, we don't anticipate that we would need to CPO any houses in the Wilden area. Um, what we can look at is we, we can look at uh, whether or not we can push the alignment slightly further north from Wilden Village. Um, that is something that uh, we would be looking at in the next stage of design under value management. It should be noted that the most of the alignment to the north of Wilden Village is in a cutting and therefore um, it is not going to be hugely visible to uh, Wilden Village at all, but we can certainly look at moving it slightly uh, further north and moving it away from the points where it is close to, well, it's closest to um, uh, any properties. I know on the west side, the closest point is to the village hall, uh, and there are some uh, properties a bit closer on Checkers Hill. We can certainly move, uh, look to see if we can move that. So thank you for that. And then the final question on this slide, are all cost elements for Routy included in the latest costings or are other parties paying for any significant construction such as uh, reconstruction expansion of Bedford Station? I mean, Will, you might want to jump in on this one as well, but uh, to start it off, um, the, the costs that we have included for Bedford Station include only for the works required for East West Rail to be able to bring uh, services into Bedford Station. Um, should there be a requirement from other parties to look at uh, a substantial relocation to the station, 
or an expansion of the station uh, requirements as part of a larger redevelopment, then that's something that we have not got in our costs at the moment and is something that we would expect to have conversations with other parties. Will, I don't know if I'll invite you in if you've got any further to say on that. I think that's, I think, I think, I think that's right. Uh, Paul, what this does allow us to do is to deliver the East-West Rail scheme. That's what we're tasked to do um, and to you know, provide the necessary capacity at Bedford and at Bedford Station. You know, if others as part of that project you know, want to take advantage of the fact that work is being done there you know, to make further improvements, you know, that is something we can do. It may well be the most efficient thing to do, but, but then obviously those costs, costs will fall to those who are... Um, you know, you know who, who are seeking those improvements um yeah so i think hopefully, hopefully that covers the, the points raised so if we can move on to the next please so we're now going to look at a few more questions uh, looking at some of the design proposals so first question I do not understand the need to build two extra tracks within the built up area north uh, of North Bedford. This will cause huge damage to the local community. Why can't the two extra tracks be introduced north of the urban community areas of Bedford and avoid this damage? I think the first thing I'd like to say here is that um, we certainly do not go, we certainly haven't put this design together um, thinking that impacting on people's houses and on people's lives is something that we want to do. What we have been doing is looking at the operational requirements in the area and how can we deliver the best, by best I mean the most resilient and most reliable service, knowing that uh, today serv rail services are not exactly renowned within the country as being particularly reliable, and it's something we've been set up to, to try and improve on. Um, as Will mentioned before, um, there are uh, some capacity issues uh, on the existing Midland mainline. However, what we need to do is we need to be able to get a timetabled service from Oxford to Cambridge. And in order to do that, we, are, uh, we will be operating on existing uh, network rail infrastructure at both those ends. We need to find what's known as the white space, i.e. the space between trains, to be able to get our services from Oxford to Cambridge within our preferred timetable or our, our required timetable, which is um, on a regular clock face of every 15 minutes. Trying to tie those white spaces together on all of the uh, <coughs> existing network rail infrastructure um, is, is very difficult and we would not be in, in control of any timetable changes in the future. So this means that we couldn't guarantee that our services would be able to operate within that 15 minute uh, or every 15 minute service for trains an hour. In addition, um, there are systems interface issues which we need to consider uh, between um, particularly lines that are using more modern signaling equipment versus lines that are using traditional signaling equipment. And I think we've all seen the articles in the press about Crossrail and the difficulties of system integration. This is another, another factor that has to be taken into account, uh, considering, uh, considering how East West Rail services get into Bedford Midland Station and then how they continue further north with uh, about 800 metres between Brom and Road Bridge and the point at which we start to turn, uh, turn east. And so, the, and so the design is showing at the moment that the only way that we can guarantee those services is to put in a segregated railway from the existing infrastructure. Um, and, this is, uh, and this has resulted in the two extra tracks being required. Now, we do have um, all of the options that we have looked at in the technical report. And um, we have looked at using the existing four track railway. Um, and we have looked at um, uh, just adding us uh, one new track 
as well as two tracks uh, on the east, on the west, and one on the east and one on the west. And, and at present, the, the design is showing that two tracks on the, on the east side is, is the solution that can guarantee the services that we need to go and deliver. And this is not something we put forward lightly at all. Um, if there is any way that we could find a way that we would not have to impact on people's properties uh, uh, to make this work with that guarantee, then that is exact, absolutely what we would, will be doing. Um, but the, the situation right now is it's demonstrating we need that segregated railway in order to deliver the services and the two extra tracks on the east side are the solution that uh, actually provides the least damage whilst delivering that service. And so, and so that is the reason why that is being shown as the uh, emerging preference uh, for this section. Um, how will the viaduct proposed to run across the A6, Paula Radcliffe Way and Clapham Road be designed sensitively to match its historic surroundings? Uh, this is a, a good question. Um, uh, we are very conscious of the fact that um, things like uh, railway viaducts can be something that are enjoyed by people and seen as uh, visually enhancing a landscape when, when uh, put together in a, a considerate and thoughtful way and not uh, a blot on the landscape. There are numerous uh, train programs on at the moment and the adverts for these programs and the, the, the photography that is often shown often shows trains on structures. Um, and so as we take the design forward, um, we will be looking at how we can fit the, the infrastructure in, in a sensitive way to its surroundings. Um, so that we can make it something that it's attractive and, and that people are proud of uh, that they've got within the area and, and see how this can become a, a landmark in the area, as I say, that people want to travel across to come and see it rather than something that is a blot on the landscape. So it, it's, a, it's a good question and it's very, uh, something that we will be looking at at the next stage of design. So thank you. Uh, next, please. And I'll now be handing over to Kirsty. Um, thanks, Paul. Hi, I'm Kirsty Young. I'm the head of programme consent for East West Rail Co. Um, and I'm the the lead on, on um, land and property for for the for the company. Um, there have been obviously a number of questions around about sort of you know impacts upon properties and in sort of the area, and obviously particular focus on the the North Bedford area. Um, so I'll, I'll run through some some other kind of key questions that have come in, but just as a little bit of a recap before before I do this. Um, we, we have, a, through, through the, the course of this consultation, we, we initially wrote to, to um, all the landowners basically right at the start or just ahead of the consultation um, to let everybody, um, any landowners where we were identifying sort of land as being potentially required by our potentials, uh, by our proposals rather, to, to write to them sort of personally with a, a land plan and, and invite them to a meeting, um, a, a remote meeting really with, with a specialist land team um, with the surveyors and the design team to really talk through the proposals and to sort of explain how 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 the, the how, how they, they might be impacted upon the future and to sort of understand that you know how they're using the land and how we can potentially mitigate or, or minimize impacts as we as we go forward. Uh, we've had a number of those meetings um, and obviously we're we're engaging sort of more widely as well with, with communities and in particular areas like like north of Bedford and, and other areas through the general consultation. Um, one of the other things that we, um, we, we're aware of is, is by publishing our proposals, um, obviously that can, can have a, a potentially may, may have an effect on, on people that are looking to sell their property um, with this sort of uncertainty around about sort of the, the proposals and what that may mean for the property in the future. Um, there is uh, statutory provisions there that, that, that can cover that, but they come in quite later in the process when the development consent order is actually submitted. Um, so we've looked at a, a discretionary purchase scheme that would seek to, to try and minimise um, hardship cases ahead of that time 
um, and to look at people maybe if, if they're having difficulties selling their property, um, certain eligible property ahead of that, um, is there ways that we can, can help them. So we are currently consulting on a scheme there. So really would encourage anybody with, with um, sort of interested in, in that area or want to feed in any sort of um, in, impacts in that area to, to respond to that, to that consultation. We do have a dedicated team in place um, that are, are currently talking to, to people and we will continue with, with engagement as, as we go, go, go forward. Um, probably turn on to the next slide and just pick up on some of the specific questions that have maybe been asked about property in, in, this, in this area. As I said, we have written to all, um, to all landowners um, potentially affected by the scheme. Um, within the sort of North Bedford area, obviously there was a, a number of properties that have been identified for has been required for or would be required for demolition um, or maybe required for demolition associated with a six track proposal. Um, within that area as well, I think we, we note that the, the data suggests that actually um, there is potentially a, a, a lot of occupiers who may not have, hold a registered land interest um, in, in the property. So we have written to um, th those, those people at the beginning of the consultation more, more generally with the consultation summary, um, but we are also, um, uh, we are also providing um, a, a letter to, to people at the moment because one of the other things we, has been flagged by some of the councillors is potentially is there a, is there a language um, barrier with, with the, the residents in, in that area, maybe with a number of different um, languages. So we are we are sending another letter to the people within that area to, to see if that is an issue. Um, it's not something that's been raised to us di directly by any, any parties. We've not had um, any requests for, for translations of, of documents, um, but we're, we're, we're sending a letter out to both the, the landowners in the area and also to the residents in the area to, to really sort of check that people have been able to, to um, understand our proposals and therefore are able to, to respond if, if they want to do so. Uh, the other question that was just asked more sort of generally was there any other um, properties identified for demolition within the sort of wider Bedford area um, and as, as Paul was, was alluding to sort of earlier on we're looking to minimise you know any impacts upon on residential and, and other properties as much as we can. Um, there, is, there is one other within the, the technical report we do know that there is one other um, residential property in, in the wider um, Wilden Parish area which has been currently identified as being required for demolition but again we will continue to, to look for ways to to minimize the, the impacts in, in that way. Uh, I think I will hand over to um, maybe is it Will coming up next if we can move on to the next slide. Uh, no sorry it's Michael for environment. Thank you. Thanks Kirsty. Um, good evening everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Shanks. Um, I'm Head of Environment at East West Rail. Um, I just wanted to pick up some of the key environmental issues that have been raised so far. Um, but first, I think I just wanted to say that, you know, we are looking to deliver a generally sustainable form of, tra excuse me, of transport uh, for the community. Um, and as part of that, we'll consider all environmental aspects. Um, and to support that, we do a run sustainability policy. That has nine principles that covers a range of different areas from carbon to noise to biodiversity, landscape, and so on. Um, and that's there so that those principles are going to inform the work we do and our design team to ensure that those issues are considered beginning the design process. So we can look to really focus on avoid and minimize the impacts on both communities and the environment. Um, but really turning a bit more specifically to some of the questions that have come through to us recently. Uh, the first is, um, uh, the question is, what about the environment of damage? Your preferred line is going right through Clapham Woods. Um, so thank you for the question. Um, it's something that's come up um, from a number of different people actually during the consultation. Um, and I just want to start by saying that, you know, caring for the environment is at the center of everything that we do, as I've already suggested. Um, and we've prioritised environment at this stage of design, really to ensure that all aspects of environment sustainability are robustly considered for all environmental topics, you know, and that includes things from air quality to ecology and biodiversity, historic environment, landscape, noise, uh, noise and vibration, and so on. Uh, and we really do want uh, the environment to change for the better as a result of the scheme, um, which is why we've committed to delivering biodiversity net gain. 
Um, specific the internet game, um, what steps can we take along the corridor to, to support that, enable it? Um, well, in, to some extent, it will depend on the selected route alignment and the assessments we undertake associated with that. But also important to be influenced by and be dependent on discussions with stakeholders such as yourselves um, and also wildlife trusts. Um, really to look for opportunities to, to create and enhance habitats to support biodiversity net gain. And some of those opportunities we see at the minute are around the Great Ouse River Valley and the opportunity for enhancing developing wetlands in the area. Um, another is related to the West Cambridge Woodlands, the Hundreds Project Living Landscape Project. Uh, again, we see opportunities there in relation to woodland um, and understand as well that there's a, there's a Bedford Northern Fringes opportunity area. So again, looking at that in terms of uh, really supporting that ambition to create a linear network of green space and whether we can support that activity. So we see some opportunities um, around that we'd like to potentially get involved in. Um, as I've suggested, each stage of planning and developing East West Rail, um, we are looking to make sure environment's been properly considered um, and that it's very much part of our decision-making processes. Uh, so all the alignment options were identified for the new railway between Bedford and Cambridge as a result of that consideration uh, do avoid directly impacting important environmental and heritage sites in the area. Uh, things such as listed buildings, uh, ancient woodland, sites with spe uh, special scientific interests, so triple SIs, um, and that does in fact include avoiding direct impact on Clapham Wood, Clapham Woods, which we don't anticipate directly impacting um, based on our current alignments. Uh, we're also trying to avoid other uh, key areas, such as priority habitats. Um, but, you know, we do recognise that there will be impacts as a result of the new railway. Um, and we intend to work very hard to reduce those um, through sensitive design and through mitigation that we can implement. Um, but, of course, you know, this is a consultation and we encourage you to raise concerns you have about environment um, when you respond to consultation feedback um, by the 9th of June, of course. Uh, moving on to the second question regarding proposed embankments in Clapham. Uh, the question relates to the fact that it will be 50 metres above the carriageway um, and asking if there will be noise contours being provided so we can understand the noise impact on local residents. Uh, so just reiterating the point again, um, you know, environment very much is at the heart of our decision making process, as are what possible mitigations might be for any potential impacts. Uh, and that clearly includes consideration of noise and vision impact. Uh, and assessments related to what noise and vision impacts will be part of our environmental impact assessment process. But the preliminary findings of that will be reported in the next consultation as part of a preliminary information, environmental information report. And then, of course, we have a full EIA, uh, which will be completed and uh, be presented as an environmental statement as part of our DCO application. Um, now, our assessments will use industry leading computer modelling, which will help us stimulate potential noise and vibration impacts along the whole route. Um, and really, as part of those assessments, it will also help us identify potential mitigation for any impacts we identify. And of course, as you'd expect, um, in line with government's noise policy, we aim to avoid or minimise negative impacts on health and quality of life uh, for local residents and communities along the uh, East West Rail route. And we're committed to considering measures that reduce those noise and vibration impacts. Um, so, for example, choice of trains is important. Um, some trains are noisier than others. So we'll think carefully about the pros and cons of using different types of trains. Track technology uh, is potentially another uh, important issue to consider because the way we design and construct tracks can have an impact on noise and vibration. Uh, and of course, noise barriers is another area that we'll, we'll look at carefully, consider what might be appropriate in terms of mitigation to, to reduce any noise impacts that, that might be relevant. Um, moving on to the final question on this slide. Um, uh, the question is, I'm very concerned <clears throat> over the extra risk of flooding. We were flooded in Clapham at Christmas and, and major infrastructure works in the case of piling for a viaduct could affect the water table. Added to the imminent construction of 500 houses, I have, a, I have massive concerns over placement of surface water. Um, so flood risk, obviously really important. It's a really important consideration for us in terms of building a new railway. 
you know, history is full of examples of risks uh, that flooding can pose to trains. Um, and I'm also conscious that flooding is a very current issue in Clapham and other areas following the Christmas floods in 2020. Uh, there are a number of options for building railways in flood zones, including the use of embankments or viaducts. Um, and assessments around flood zones have been carefully considered in our approach to route alignment so far. Um, and one of our key environmental principles is indeed protecting new and local communities from flooding and ensuring no increase in, in flood risk. Uh, to support that, uh, we are developing flood risk assessments uh, to, help, to help inform our design process. Um, and they'll look to incorporate uplifts to account for changing climate, as well as recent historic events such as last year's flooding. Um, now work is ongoing in this area um, and we've established uh, and have an ongoing and regular engagement with the Environment Agency to share information, uh, as well as data and modelling to support that work. And, and similar to many of the other areas, we'll also provide further information during our, our next consultation, the statutory consultation um, that follows on from the current consultation. Um, that, I think, was uh, what I was going to say on those three points. I think that probably moves on to freight potentially next. Um, is that you, Will, covering freight? It, it is, yeah. So um, we're being asked what are our plans for um, what are our plans for freight? And I think here, um, if we move on to the next slide, um, will the line that passes through uh, Clapham be used for overnight freight? So we've, we've set out our hours uh, of operation and we don't envisage at this point that there will be um, over overnight freight. Um, you know, we have set out that there you know, there is you know, capacity on East West Rail for for some freight, um, but actually the most likely limiting factor is those that get to you know is, is how people get to and from uh, East West uh, Rail, um, you know, in the first place. So you know whether that's from Felixstowe to Cambridge or or whatever. So. Um, you know, we don't, as I say, we don't, there is some capacity there, there no doubt will be some freight usage, um, but, uh, you know, there, there are constraints elsewhere in the system, but as I've said, just, just to, because I know some people are asking me to answer the question, we don't, you know, the hours of operation mean we don't foresee overnight freight, um, sort of in the line, with the line that passes through Clapham, um, you know, that, that we're constructing. So in terms of other questions on freight, um, I, I'm not sure there's any that have come up sort of specifically um, in our, um, uh, you know, sort of that, that have been sent to us, but, you know, no doubt as we get into sort of the, the Q&A, there will, there will be more. I can see some coming through into the, into the, into the Q&A box, but we'll, as I say, we'll deal with those, you know, as we get to the Q&A session itself. So if we move on to the next one, um, just in terms of touching on our approach to consultation, um, you know, we're being asked whether we will extend the consultation to allow for face-to-face -face events. You know, I think I think the first thing to say here is that you know, we, you know, quite a number of projects have uh, done consultation uh, with the restrictions that have been in place. We've been following the guidelines, you know, to do that. We've had you know, good attendance in the um, you know, in the online uh, virtual consultation rooms. We've had good attendance um, at briefing meetings um, and live chat at Q and A. Um, we've written to two hundred and seventy thousand households. So we've given people the opportunity uh, to engage with us and to to ask questions and to be able to ask both general questions in events like these, but also specific questions uh, to our experts through um, live chat events. Um, so given the uncertainty about when face-to-face -face events will be able to return and the fact that we, are, uh, we have done a 10-week consultation and people are having the opportunity to respond, they are you know, responding in, in good numbers already, we, we don't see that it's appropriate to extend the consultation. We're, we're being asked in terms of how we will analyze the feedback from the consultation and rank the concepts. 
Um, the answer here is every single response to consultation will be read. You know, the key themes and points will be you know, sort of brought together so we can look at the feedback in, in, in all of the areas and that will be used to inform our um, that will be used to inform our uh, assessment of the 15 assessment factors that we have set out um, and therefore the sorry I'm having some problems with my connectivity um, so we will use them to apply the uh, set assessment factors um, and uh, that you know that will that will then be set out which leads us to the second question the third, the third question on the concepts when they will know which have been selected that is very much um, about how we prepare for the statutory consultation and so within the next year we will be coming forward uh, with proposals for the statutory consultation um, and that will include um, that will include you know which of the concepts have been taken forward as our preferred options um, you know but that again won't be the final decision on those there will be people plenty of opportunity for people to contribute to feedback on those before they finally go into the DCO submission um, and I think that is where the you know the key input of will you know the key decisions will finally be made um and uh, when the sort of concepts for sure will have been selected that will then be considered by the planning inspector so um we will within the next year having taken on board your feedback having completed our analysis for the statutory consultation set out what those preferred concepts are and then what on based on your feedback again at statutory consultation that will be taken forward to the dco um, so hopefully that answers your questions there. And then as we move on to the next section, um, just before we go to the sort of open Q&A, um, so people have got plenty of time to respond uh, and, and ask us questions, um, sort of four key ways for people to get involved. The virtual consultation rooms remain open through till the 9th of uh, June. We've got a series of live chat events uh, going on i think we've got about five remaining uh, live chat events and we'll give you the dates for those that's where participants are able to discuss directly with members of our project team their specific questions also uh, the dedicated phone line we're getting a good number of phone calls and you know that that's really important to us because we recognize that not everybody will want to or be able to engage online um, and speak to members of the project team um, and then in terms of the uh, feedback form, uh, the opportunity there, um, you know, is available online through to the 9th of June. And that does give people, you know, the, the, the kind of main opportunity uh, send their feedback to us so we can take that into account. Because, of course, what we're hearing in events like this and others will be taking uh, will be taken into account. But it is really through actual submissions to the consultation that we, you know, that 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 this is you know, that that's the most important thing to us in terms of what we're what we're sort of uh, making sure we've got that all properly recorded and it is being being taken into account. So if we flick onto the next slide. It that just does confirm the five live chat events remaining tomorrow evening, Saturday afternoon, Monday afternoon, then Tuesday and Wednesday evenings as well. Um, so plenty of opportunity to ask direct questions and then as I was saying in terms of responding to the consultation it is this is really important that we do get those formal responses um, you know, through the online form by emailing us um, or if people want to send in um, hard copy responses uh, to free post East West Rail um, if people do need paper copies of forms they drop us an email or give us a call we can make sure that we can make sure that happens so um i think that brings us to the end of uh, the presentation and really now throwing the floor open to your questions and answers we know we've had quite a lot come through the chat bar and we will try and address those 
So, Geordie, over to you to, to, to take us through the questions. Thanks, Will. Um, so, as I said on my message on the chat, um, we because we've received so many questions, we're going to uh, tackle them in order of submission. They have fallen actually quite aligned with what the points that we were covering. So, um, starting from the very top, uh, first person to submit a question was Chris Q. I'm not sure if Chris, you want to raise this yourself to the to the group, or do you want me to, to read it um, on your behalf? Um, but um, I'll, I'll start, and then you can jump in if you want. But basically, so the first question that Chris submitted was costs for the rebuild of the station. Is this outside of the proposed cost you submitted? Seems odd how Route E only had a marginal increase in cost, yet all other in, uh, all others increased by more than sixty percent. And uh, follow-up question to that was, have you shared with residents the visual of uh, this viaduct over the uh, Polo Radcliffe Way? So I think on the first point, Will, you might want to take that. Yeah, no, I think it's, I think it's really important to be clear um, that the costs of Bedford Station as relating to East West Rail are absolutely included. So the costs of rebuilding the station um, are included. We were simply making the point which I think is fair, which is if in addition to rebuilding the station and putting the capacity in that is necessary for East West Rail, um, there is, um, you know, there is other works that are required, you know, as part of wider improvements to the railway network, then th they are not yet included and others would need to fund those. But in terms of everything that is necessary for East West Rail, including rebuilding the station, um, that is included. Um, so, so, so hopefully that is clear. Um, and I know some people are asking about the cost increases. We have um, we have set out, you know, how the costs have matured over time and what has been included, you know, particularly in terms of how uh, you know, floodplains are needing to be dealt with um, and 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 things like that, and also treatment of the depot on the approach into Bedford and and, and those sorts of things. But that is all set out in data in and in cost data that we have published on our website, so people are able to track the development of our costs over time. Uh, brilliant, thanks. Um, uh, and around the second question that he raised was, have you shared with residents the visual of this viaduct over the Polo Radcliffe Way? So, so let me let me pick that up. You know, we have we have a choice here we are consulting at an early stage and we're consulting at a stage when you know it is you know our designs are not at a sufficiently mature stage to uh provide um you know sensible and realistic visuals um but the choice that we took was we could wait till statutory consultation to do any engagement at all uh, that is the point at which projects normally produce the kind of visuals that you're talking about. But by holding the non-statutory consultation that we are, um, that is about early engagement. That does mean some information won't be available because the information isn't complete as it is or will be at statutory consultation. And therefore we aren't able uh, right now to provide uh, the kind of visuals that I understand people want and that we will be able to provide at the statutory consultation, but that we that we can't provide right now. But the trade off we the decision that we made was it was better to consult early to get people's input and feedback early, so we can take that into account, or albeit recognizing that we don't have as much information now as we will do at the point of statutory consultation. Um. Brilliant. Before we move on, um, just um, Justin, I've seen that you've written in the chat, which I you want to kind of like follow up on that point around the visuals. Uh, if not, we'll move on to the next question. But um, Well, so just we can... very quickly, uh, sorry, Will, with respect, um, I commissioned uh, some CGIs and the cost about 600 quid for the viaduct and embankment around Roxton. You could have done it. You chose not to do it. So I, I think this comes to the maturity of design that we think is required to produce good, reliable, accurate visuals that you know, can form the basis of a consultation. 
and, and, and we just don't think we're there yet. That, that, that's my view. We disagree. Um, I, I can see that Alison has raised her hand. Um, Alison, is this linked to the visuals? Um, uh, absolutely. I, um, I, want, I have asked East Wales Rail Company to have details of your landscape architects who have been informing you, or we trust are informing you about visual impact. I've tried to look through the you know, consultation documents to find any analysis of visual impact. The most I've seen referred to is a zone of uh, visual influence, ZVI, and also um, some notes about the impact in views. But the amount of visual information considering the impact is absolutely minimal and derisory. And I just cannot understand why more information on landscape and on biodiversity haven't been released into the public sphere. Because how can we comment? We feel, I think the general public feel that this route has been designed the wrong way round in the absence of environmental information. So, and then afterwards, um, you know, then it's too late. So if you can point me to where ecological and in, the, in this, you know, for this particular uh, question, visual information is, I would be very grateful. Um, perhaps I'll just chip in. Um, so as part of the technical report, obviously we reference um, some of the environmental considerations and issues for each of the alignments within the body of the report, but also we include information on the um, assessment factors, which does refer to, to landscape and biodiversity and so on in relation to each of the alignments and makes a comparison between them. Um, I think it's, you know, as Will has suggested, we're quite early on <clears throat> at the moment in the scheme. Um, and, you know, we recognise that yourselves and other stakeholders are really keen to understand the specific impacts of the scheme. But given the early stage of it, we are coming out early to allow people to input and to provide us with feedback, which will then provide significantly more information at the statutory consultation, which again gives a further opportunity for feedback, which will then look to incorporate into design and consider that as part of the ongoing environmental impact assessment process. So it is very much part at the minute of what we're doing is, it's very much part of the normal environmental impact assessment process that we're following at the moment to make sure that, you know, over time, progressively we get more design information that allows us to assess it in more detail and to prepare the preliminary environmental information report that will accompany the um, statutory consultation. And then to provide, prepare the environmental statement will go to the DCO. But it is very much part of the regular standard process that all projects will follow. Well. I, I have to disagree with you there, Michael. I think, you know, the Wildlife Trust said you, that you should really have undertaken an, an SEA at the corridor stage, and I agree with that. I think many people think that. How can you, for example, fully cost in mitigation um, unless you've done a, a much greater level of environmental analysis at this stage? Otherwise, the, the community are being asked to um, consider which alignment is the least worst option. And frankly, there should have been a far greater level of environmental, archeological, cultural heritage, visual tranquility studies undertaken. And I think if you had done that, uh, you would know where there were um, sites of particular interest. Um, you know, I think it's unbelievable that one of, the, one of the few ancient woodlands in Ravenstone is being damaged by um, by, by one of the alignments. And also I know that in Colston and other areas, uh, you know, other woodlands are being, um, you know, uh, it's wrong to use the word impacted or affected. They're being destroyed in places. And I think had there been a better environmental analysis, the roots of the alignments would have been different. And I think, again, if there had been a more thorough analysis, Route E might not be at the top because the costings, the mitigation and environmental damage have not been properly integrated into the into the finances. So I've said my piece and, you know, I, I think you're compared to road schemes and other things. I think you'll be on a very sticky wicket when it comes to the DCO and this then I think East West Rail will be even more delayed. And, and I don't think that's what we want. We want the better route for East West Rail. So I'll, I'll, that's my piece. So I'll pause yeah. there, but it will come out in the consultation. 
I'm not. Yeah, I mean, to, to reassure you, as part of the work we've done, we've been doing, we've collected a significant amount of environmental data to help us understand the environment and the key features in the area. And that's been really central to the work we've done. By identifying those key features, um, we have made you know, significant attempts and efforts to actually develop alignments that, that avoid direct impact to an awful lot of those um, significant environmental features. Um, and that's the intent that we'll have going forward. And you mentioned impact, direct impact at Nature and Woodland. Currently, the alignments um, as they stand, don't have any direct impacts on any ancient woodland within the area. And we've been really clear that's something we've been uh, worked very hard to avoid any direct impacts because it's fundamental to our approach to de delivering biodiversity net gain. So there, there are areas that we've worked extremely hard on here to avoid and reduce impact where possible. And we'll continue to do that. And as we refine the design going forward, you may be able to further reduce some impacts um, and we'll begin to be able to more clearly define and develop the mitigation that will, will deal with any impacts that are remaining. But we are working extremely hard. I've got some very good information and data that's supporting what we're doing at the moment. Well, I think many people would like to see that information released to help us with our consultation response. And my initial response to that too is at the corridor stage, um, why route E, which requires a second crossing of the River Ouse, which is one of the greatest assets in North, North, North Bedfordshire, and you know, uh, you know, counting, you know, all, all sorts of designations for it. Why, why take huge, impossible to mitigate embankments and viaducts over the River Ouse when when that river cro a second river crossing isn't necessary if another route corridor was chosen? So I, I think mean that's the reason why many people feel. Clapham residents, uh, others would feel that um, the, you know there needs to be a re-examination of the route corridor options because the environmental information wasn't made fully available at that uh, corridor selection stage. Yes, yeah, so you know as part of the work we did for the route option selection, um, the route option area selection, therefore the, the corridor we're referring to, we did do um, following the initial consultation a much more detailed comparative assessment of those route options, really to evaluate the of sustainability of the different options and do a comparison of them. And that involved identifying some of the key environmental features, the route options, the difference between them, and really the relative, I suppose, merits and constraints between the different uh, route option areas. Um, and the assessment did identify that each of those route option areas had um, a number of things to consider, but in many cases they were quite common, similar issues across a number of the different route option areas. Um, but, but what it did show was that from a, a holistic point of view, looking at all of the environmental topics that I referred to earlier, whether that's landscape, sound noise and vibration, uh, biodiversity, etc., the northern approaches, oh sorry, the northern um, routes, so going by Camborne, um, so routes B and E, um, we felt provided the best opportunities for environmental perspective. And that's in essence because there were less um, constrained hotspot areas. And so we were felt more able to get alignments in those route option areas, which would avoid the significant environmental um, features in those areas. Uh, and I think that's proven to be the case as we've moved forward. I, um, can I just say then, are you, uh, I understand there are showstoppers with other routes, such as Wimpole, the National Trust land or RSPB land. But are you actually telling me that Route E has lesser environmental damage than Route B? I am aware that there is a consensus amongst environmental organisations, such as the Wildlife Trust, who came out strongly in favour of Route B. So I cannot believe that Route E is less damaging than Route B. The work, the work and I'd just like to see the, you know, and I just feel now we're doing tokenism, looking at two routes, you know, which is the least worst for all our communities, where when this reconsultation, uh, you know, uh, you know, if we what if this is meant to be a sustainable railway, it needs to start at the beginning with least environmental damage. There has always uh, it's an impossible task, you know, to design a railway. It's going to hurt certain communities, but there is a clear band of evidence, a uh, uh, sort of uh, evidence stream that that there are other least worse options than route E. And I, I just feel quite 
to be honest, quite insulted by the level of environmental information as a consultee on behalf of my parish and as an individual that I'm being asked to look at. It, it's, it's, it's extremely weak. And, and it's like, you know, gosh, this is definitely, you know, chicken, you know, it's the wrong way round, you know, and I just think you're not helping yourselves. And I, I mean, you know, the work, I, can't the work say, did, I can't say anymore. I've said my piece anyway, so I'll let others come in. Yeah, I mean, the work, the work we did around the select and preferred route option, it did show that there's some, you know, there are pros and cons to all of the route option areas, as you've suggested, you know, it's hard to get, there's, there's a balance to be had there. Um, and whilst there were some differences between route option B and route option E, when it was looked at in the round, considering all the environmental aspects and topics and features there, it didn't come out strongly in favour of either B and E. B and E were the best options. Uh, so the Richard and via Campbell were the, certainly the best from an environmental perspective. And there weren't really clear, strong differentiators between B and E. They were broadly quite similar. Brilliant, thanks, Michael. I, I can see that Phil has uh, his hand up. Uh, Phil, is, is this about the, the environmental um, assessment perspective or is it another issue? Because if not, um, there's other questions. It's, it's linked to it, I think. And I think, yeah. okay. I, I think it's worth, I mean, Alison did extremely well there. And, you know, we were, all the people on this call represent our residents, you know, we're borough councillors or parish councillors. I think, Will, when I listen to you again, give the answers you're giving and basically you're implying that we should almost be grateful that you're doing a non-statutory consultation and that everything we get we should be grateful for when I listen to that little exchange then with Michael and Alison asking some very good questions and there's clearly low you get the answers that we get to the questions we ask and people are asking hundreds of questions to you guys we're getting our residents are complaining to us all the time about the repetition of the responses they're getting. And yet we hear there from Michael, you've got evidence, you've got information, you have detail that you're not sharing, but we'll see it all at DCO and that'll be OK. We should be grateful that we're getting some now, but little drips of it. But at DCO, we'll see it all. That's OK. We can talk about it at DCO. This just isn't good enough, guys. It really isn't. You need to start thinking and having some empathy with residents of this borough in a way that some, you know, unfortunately some people in the borough don't even do themselves. You're building a railway through our communities. To hear Paul Sparrow say publicly that, you know, our residents, Clapham residents should be proud of the 15 metre concrete viaduct you're gonna build viscerally separating bed from Clapham, that it will be an attractive feature. What planet are you guys on? It's enough. You need to start actually responding and thinking about what we're saying, not just giving an answer to a question when actually that's not good enough. You know, this is not a good consultation process. You have got information you're not releasing. You're not releasing all the information on costs. You're not releasing all the information on environment. You know, you're not giving us the information in response to some of the questions that are being asked. We're continually getting repetitive answers. And it's just not good enough. Your answer on why you won't extend the consultation is in effect, well, we're doing all this stuff, so it's okay. You could choose to extend the consultation to give people of this borough the opportunity to have a face-to-face -face meeting with you like every other normal pre-pandemic consultation would be expected to do statutory or non-statutory. And you won't do it because you choose not to. That's your choice. Now, just admit it. And this just goes to show how this is a farce. You are not genuinely engaging residents. You're asking us to ask questions. You want us to make a choice between evils. And then you just give answers. And that's it. Good enough. Move on. We're not going to give you the information you want. You guys need to do better than this. Otherwise, as Alison says, at DCO, you will come unstuck. We're, we're not going to give up. And frankly, our residents are very, very, very disappointed and I'm, I'm pretty insulted by some of the comments I've heard here. I mean, that comment about the viaduct around Clapham. I can't wait to see this go public and hear what people say about that, really. I mean, Will. So look, I think you know, in relation to the consultation extension, you know, we, we took into account the factors and we did make a decision that we didn't think it was right to extend the consultation based upon all the activity that we have, we, we, we have done. We have been doing our level best to answer people's questions. We have published 
unprecedented amounts of information on cost in terms of all the back you know, in terms of all the backup cost reports we've we've ever had uh, produced we've been asked to get down to you know line by line 125,000 lines of addresses those today have been uh, published so we are we are doing you know we are spending a lot more time actually making sure that information is in a format that we can release so that we are releasing that information. Um, what we are putting into the public domain through the technical reports, through the consultation documents, through the summaries, is trying to find the right balance to make information accessible to people. And at the moment I get feedback that the technical reports are too detailed and not accessible enough, but then at the, another level I'm being told um, people want more technical information. So we are trying to find the right balance in terms of giving people meaningful information that they can engage with um, and you know at a number of in a number of different formats at a technical level uh, and then also you know in summary form at, at, at a consultation level. So we are genuinely not trying to withhold information. Um, we are trying to make ourselves available to answer questions. Um, but in some areas where ultimately either you know, information you know, on visuals, people can keep asking me on visuals. I don't have a different answer because those visuals do not exist. So where people are finding our question, our answers repetitive, it tends to be in areas where we genuinely don't have information that we can that we can give you. But we are trying to answer people's questions. It's why we're having events like this. Um, it's why we're having the live Q and A, uh, and why you know where we are, where we're being asked to release information with. We are we are we are doing the work to get it into a format that means we can release it. I've had my say, so uh, I won't take up any more time. Thank you. Um, going back to the questions raised, so um, there was one from Graham. I think yeah, he's still in, in the call with us. I'm not sure if you want to raise it yourself, Graham, but it was um, around. Um, have you commented on the BBC report showing uh, their findings that there is no need for two extra tracks north out of the Bedford station, so not needing to demolish in the poets? Um, that I'm not sure if Will or, or Paul want to. Yeah, let me let me let me kick off on this. So, um, you know, Bedford have shared that report with us. Um, that is something we will take into account over the course of the consultation. So when people put you know, technical reports to us, of course we'll take that into account. From our first reading of it, um, you know, there will be some questions that we've got and we're, we're not, you know, what we, as we've looked at, you know, the analysis we've done, it is about understanding the full Oxford to Cambridge timetable and what that means for the impact at Bedford. Um, and it, it's not clear to us yet that the SLC report takes that into account but you know we will we do take that report seriously we you know, respect the fact that bedford have had commissioned that piece of work and of course as part of their consultation response um we we will take it into account as i say it's not where our analysis has pointed to us to date um but we don't want to demolish any houses that we don't have to we don't want to cause any disruption that we don't have to and therefore if there is a way to avoid that demolition, then we will do so. So if there is insight in that report that we can use, then I, I will be delighted that that is the case. Um, I, I genuinely will. So we will take it into account. But as I say, it's not where our analysis is pointing to date. From my reading of uh, the Bedford report, uh, it clearly shows uh, ample um, time windows to run the east-west rail through Bedford on current tracks, uh, the current slow tracks, I believe they are. Uh, so there is, there is genuine um, merit in reviewing that, because uh, if you don't have to uh, deploy an extra two tracks, uh, it will save, what, 50 houses? So it's it's vital for people in that area.
as I say, I do imp I do understand how important this issue is for people you know living in the in the poets area. We genuinely don't want to demolish houses that we don't need to uh, report. We don't need to demolish. You know, we've done analysis ourselves. We are engaging with Network Rail as well. We will take the SLC report into account. But as I say, at the moment, that is not where our analysis has led us to. Um, but you know, if we, we we will do what we can. I just say, well, I mean, you, you've had that report before. You had it the last consultation. It's very very minor tweaks. This version of it. We've got a number of borough councillors on this call, including, I think, the deputy mayor. I think Michael Headley might have dropped off already. Perhaps he got bored. Perhaps any of them would like to challenge you about that six-track assertion you made earlier that you think it's still the answer it's going to be, because they're, they're the ones that desperately want to make sure the four tracks is presented. Anybody from the borough council like to uh, challenge Will on that? No. OK, interesting. Um, so next question, which actually was um, sort of um, raised by, by a few uh, people was um, when talking about the um, uh, evidence that Ruthie is, is more beneficial, um, if, if we could explain in more detail why specifically is more beneficial. So, so I think let, let, let's just break this into a couple of couple of dimensions here. The first thing is, you know, when we looked at Ruti, we look at it in the round across all the 15 assessment factors um, that we've shared. They are the same 15 assessment factors that are included in, and that we've used for uh, assessing the route alignment options that are included in the technical report uh, this time. So it is on across all of those factors that we consider the, the route options. You. If we narrow that specifically to sort of the benefits in relation to sort of transport user benefits, um, one of the key things that drives that um, that analysis is the uh, number of people in proximity to the station at Bedford, um, and also the kind of interconnectivity you get at Bedford onto other services going to other destinations. So we do, the transport user benefit modeling does suggest that it does have higher transport user benefits by serving Bedford Midland because of, as I say, the catchment area of the station and, and also the interconnectivity you get at Bedford uh, station as well. So those are the two things that are driving that particular aspect of the assessment. But in terms of the overall selection of Route E, it is the application of the 15 assessment factors. Brilliant, thanks. Um, next question on the chat. Um, this one from Mark Fitzpatrick um, asking, what is the policy about footpaths and bridleways affected by whichever route is selected? Oh, I'm not sure if you, I want to take this one. That's probably one for Paul. Yes, certainly I can take this one. So our policy is to keep all public rights of way and roads for that matter open. Um, and that's the reason why the, the railway actually, the current designs are as they are, is because we're not able to put in uh, new level crossings. That's against the Office of uh, Rail and Road policy. Um, that's why our designs are at some of the uh, vertical alignments that they are because we want to keep those things open. We understand how important those are to communities. You know, they're critical connections to, to allow people to get on uh, with their lives. Um, so our policy is to keep them open. Now, in some circumstances, we may need to uh, put in some diversions, but we will keep the connectivity going. Brilliant. Can I ask, um, thank you, Paul, for that. Um, can I ask, when you say diversions, how far do you would you see as being reasonable for a diversion? For a diversion, um, oh, we're we're trying to keep it to, to as minimal as possible. I mean, it's going to be on a case by case basis. Um, I don't think many will need diversions, but we need to do more detailed design in the next stage to confirm that. But we'll keep it as minimal as possible because we do want to understand, you know, increasing journey time substantially. It, it is not the right solution for communities. Thank you very much, Paul. 
on that uh, follow-up from Justin, uh, who's asking, do you have any policy requirements to enhance public uh, right of way? Um, in terms of enhancement, uh, not directly, no. Um, it's not something that has been set as a requirement for us, but we will uh, we will certainly make sure that uh, whatever we do uh, with public rights of way, the existing public rights of way and the roads, that we will uh, try and keep them wherever we can, as I said before. Brilliant, thanks. I'm not sure if, uh, Justin, you want to follow up to any on, on that. If not, we'll move on to the next question. Uh, oh, sorry, did you? I said, no, that's fine. Please oh, carry oh, on. Apologies, <laughs> thanks. Um, so next question on the on the uh, list um, is from uh, Chris again. Um, the Victorians would follow existing flatter, shorter and more direct travel routes. Has anyone considered the typography and geography of the land and how much devastation you'll cause with cutting it? Um, again, I suppose, Paul. Yes, yeah, so... Uh, a few points on this. I mean, when you look at the existing railway, uh, a, a lot of the new railway, and certainly the, the railways when they were built, were built on uh, embankments. They were built in cuttings, on viaducts, uh, in tunnels. Um, uh, uh, certainly, when you look out of a train window, you don't necessarily recognise today when you're on a cutting or what, uh, sorry, in a cutting or on a, an embankment because of the, the tree growth around the place. It makes you think that you're constantly at ground level. Um, but everything was built on a, an embankment or, or a cutting. You, even some of the stuff that looks flat is on a small embankment. Um, the other thing that is very different from the Victorian times to today, and I, I just mentioned this before to do with the roads, is that the use back then, level crossings could be used and installed. And at which point you could keep road and rail at the same grade or the same level. We can't use that. It is the Office of Road, uh, Rail and Roads policy that no new level crossings should be uh, built unless under exceptional circumstances. And so what we do need to look at is a grade separation, i.e. separating the vertical alignment between the road and the rail. Uh, and, and that does mean that our designs have to be a little bit different. I think the other thing to consider is, um, is also climate change and flood. I mean, we, we saw, I'm sure we all read in the press, the impact of uh, the substantial water ingress into the embankments up in Scotland and the deaths that occurred there. This is something that we need to be planning in. This is not a, a railway for the next 20 years, it's a railway for the next 100 years. And so we need to design resilience into the railway. And, and that require that results in a number of design requirement differences to uh, the Victorian times. However, I would say that there are still similarities. We just don't always see it when we make our journeys today. Brilliant. Thanks, Paul. Um, conscious of the time, we have a couple uh, more uh, themes like that um, we could, I suppose, like quickly tackle. but. There were a few questions around um, if um, going through Bedford is, is kind of uh, such an issue, why not uh, either go in and out or like avoid Bedford Midland Station altogether? Um, I'm not sure if um, Will or Paul would like to, to take this one. You're on. You know, I'm trying to take myself off mute. Sorry about that. Um, so, um, as we said, there are um, sort of significant benefits to um, serving Bedford Midland in terms of benefits for transport users because of onward connectivity uh, and those and, and factors like that. Um, in terms of the proposal to come in and out of um, sort of Bedford, I, I guess sort of serving Wixom's and then a sort of a, a reversing move into and out of uh, Bedford. Um, this is, um, you know, 
this is something that sort of was looked at in some of the cost data that we have released. You know, this, this was looked at much earlier by Network Rail in the process, and it was um, very expensive. So that is, that is one reason for which it's been um, e excluded. It also adds significantly to the journey time, not to mention the operational complexity of doing it. So for, for a variety of reasons, that move you know, remaining south but moving into and out of Bedford um, it doesn't seem to be a realistic uh, option for us to deliver and we concluded that it is better to provide the connectivity at Bedford Midland that, that Ruti provides so as I say it, it was looked at by Network Rail much earlier in the process and, and that is set out in the in the cost data that we have published. Brilliant. Um, and then I think final thing that we haven't touched uh, on yet in, in the questions, um, which is around uh, freight. There were a few, um, but uh, so uh, for example, Martin asked about, um, so if overnight freight is likely in the future, Chris also asked around if the line will link Felixstowe and, and Horwich uh, with the West Coast also, what about links to the nuclear power station and, and shipping waste? So I, I suppose like three in one. So um, as I say, we are still looking at the at the freight options for um, East West Rail in terms of where the demand is um, and the sort of likely traffic. There are there are challenges as I've said, with a sort of capacity constraint elsewhere on the network that is, you know, is likely to impact the use of uh, freight on, on East West Rail. I think, as we've said in the technical document, you know, there is capacity for about one freight train per hour um, in the operating hours on East West Rail. But as I say, that is both dependent on demand and also you know, the capacity elsewhere in the network to, to reach East West Rail. We are doing more work on what the likely demand for freight is and what the likely capacity for, for freight um, you know, elsewhere in the network and what that means for getting onto and off East West Rail. So we will be able to set that out at, um, at the point of statutory consultation. But it, it genuinely isn't that we've got much more detail on this that we're not sharing. Um, you know, we are doing the work so that we can have, you know, an informed conversation with the department about some of the choices that they will need to make so that we can then have an informed discussion with the uh, public as part of the statutory consultation with an analysis of the impact that it will have in terms of noise and and all those things um you know it, it's not that we're sort of blind to this it is that further work is necessary before we can be more definitive than we have been um but we have done our best to give an indication that it is you know capacity for for one freight train per hour during the hours of operation. Brilliant, thanks Will. I'm just conscious that we have uh, slightly overrun, uh, but um, mindful that like, uh, I just want to make sure that kind of everyone that had a question has been able to raise it. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if kind of like there are any final uh, questions that people would like to, to make. Um, um, before we, we draw these to to a close, um, I've I've seen in the chat PV, which I'm I'm not entirely sure who who they are, um, but has asked specifically about the the waste um, element on on freight, and also uh, Tim Tim Wood has asked about um, uh, uh, Paul putting in magments on the top of hills must mean you're planning on floods of biblical proportions. Has the carbon impact out of every train for the next 120 years climbing 70 meters vertically being calculated? I suppose with those two questions. So I suppose we if you want to address like the one on on freight, um, or if if PB would like to clarify that point specifically. Um, if if not, I suppose we can move on and um, think. I'm not entirely the sure, like if you wouldn't mind. I'm trying. The, the question is about the waste. I haven't heard a satisfactory answer yet, which was 
Um, we're seeing documentation coming out of um, Ipswich and Southampton of freight uh, moving waste around to the incinerator nearby. Um, and with East West Rail saying that they want six tracks, not the four that Bedford Borough Council would, would wish, um, I'd like some clarification on whether East West Rail do need the six tracks and how important waste transfer is to their operations going forward. Let me let me let me just take, again take myself off mute. So, you know, I don't think it is the consideration of uh, waste transfer that is that is driving our decision for six tracks. Um, but as I say, in terms of what we are, in terms of what the likely demand for freight is, that is something that we're still we are still looking at. So I, I, I can't give you a better answer than that. But it isn't, to be clear, it isn't um, our kind of you know, it isn't the focus on waste transfer that is leading us to conclude that six tracks is necessary. It is in order to be able to deliver a reliable passenger service without also impacting upon the other passenger services that Bedford is used for. Brilliant. Um, then um, we we can, um, Paul, I'm not sure if you want to quickly touch on uh, Tim's point around the uh, the, the meters that the railway would have to to climb um, from the question of of team I can I can repeat it if, if he doesn't want to um, come up but basically it was like putting embankments on the top of hills must mean you're planning on floods of biblical proportions has a carbon impact of every train for the next 120 years can climb these 70 meters vertically being calculated I'm not sure if we've lost all there. Oh, if not. Um. So, Jordi, <clears throat> I can I can make some reference to carbon if that's helpful um, as part of that question. Um, so, as part of the work we've done so far, and it is referenced in the technical report, um, as part of the environmental factors, we did include consideration of greenhouse gas emissions in relation to the alignments. Um, and as we again we go forward as part of our assessment process, we'll again develop that thinking in those assessments um, in terms of the potential carbon impacts as we need to get more detail on the alignments, because clearly from a carbon perspective, um, the detailed design of the alignments, the construction methodologies and so on are important in terms of understanding the carbon baseline. Um, and we'll consider those sort of the life cycle greenhouse gas gases as part of the assessment um, and that would include um, I would expect both the embodied carbon to carbon uh, that's embodied in the construction materials as well as the operational aspects of the scheme as well. Um, clearly the embodied carbon make up a significant portion of the total emissions um, and again we'll, we'll look to understand that better through the baseline as we develop that and we'll look at a range of different things to try and reduce um, the, the embodied carbon because clearly we're committed or we're, we're aiming to deliver a net zero carbon railway and therefore the lower the carbon embodied carbon we can have as part of the scheme the easier it is for, for us to achieve that. Um, so we're looking at exploring options for <clears throat> the construction, the materials we use, how we source materials, how we design the scheme to reduce um, to reduce waste and in terms of materials and methodologies we use to construct the railway, railway with a view to uh, trying to minimize um, the carbon footprint of the construction. Similarly, we'll look at um, on-site construction activities to try and reduce um, the carbon emissions as a result of the on-site construction activities. And similarly, as we move forward into operations, we're looking at opportunities to, to reduce carbon um, and means of actually trying to um, achieve carbon reductions and indeed opportunities to sequester carbon through habitat creation, tree planting, that type of thing to actually ultimately reduce our carbon footprint. Uh, so that's a bit of a, hopefully a bit of an overview of some of the work we're looking at from a carbon perspective, but the other elements of that question I'm less able to deal with. Yeah, and if, Michael, if I take the, the rest of it, in terms of um, 
you know, asking about em embankments on top of the hill. We, we don't have an embankment on top of the hill. We'll be going into cutting. In terms of the amount of rise from the ground level uh, by the Great Ooze Way uh, to the point at which we get to the other side of the, the, the Great Ooze um, uh, beyond the uh, Paula Radcliffe Way, the, the railway is actually only raised 12 metres, so nowhere near 70 metres. So we, we understand that, um, you know, the, the floods in the area it, are a significant issue, and that's the reason why the design is on viaduct, to minimise the impact on the flow of the floods. Um, but we very much understand that, um, that we need to be, you know, proactively involved with flood management and certainly not making the situation worse. Um, and we also uh, we also understand that you know uh, putting things like embankments on on top of hills isn't the right way to go as well, and that's why we do have a cutting on the on the other side of the Grey Twos. Brilliant, thank you, Michael and Paul. Um, I'm very conscious that we've overrun for by quite a while, uh, but um, Alison, um, is is there any Thing else that you want to raise and then then we'll just uh draw the session to a close yes i asked a question um about developer contributions and what proportion developer contributions will make to the construction costs of the railway because when i look at the alignments and one of the things i don't understand is that i you know that either of the preferred alignments are connecting communities that don't exist and don't have planning permission and are not even in local plans. So I just find that, again, a surprising way to design a railway. I know that in the consultation documents, there are many statements about optimizing growth. And obviously that growth is being used to fund, the, is, is, it, is that growth being used to fund the railway or is it just a means of, con, because why, you know, uh, creating a sustain, more sustainable community? Again, it's this chicken and egg. I, I just find this a most surprising part of the of the um, design because the railway station is going to determine where growth happens. And yet, you know, this is not the way that planning permissions are gained, you know, through local plan processes. So I find this a very confusing aspect that I don't understand. If the if the railway then all railways, all big engineering projects overrun in their costs, would there then be more of a requirement to seek additional growth um, to help fund the railway? Uh, just, this is a, I think it's a very uncomfortable association. Um, Oxford Cambridge Arc dictating growth. This railway is delivering a route, as I say, to connect communities that don't exist, when potentially a route to the south would actually link in with where there is the Wixoms and when there where there is other growth, for example, um, already earmarked. So, if you could throw shed some light on the con connections and the costings from, as I say, unplanned growth, new stations, you know, how how does that fit in with determining the alignments? Because potentially there might be a less environmentally damaging alignment if it wasn't quite so tied up with the growth agenda. If you can understand, you know, I, I, you know I'm not, because I think it's quite a different, you know, it's, it's, it's a concept that I don't think has been aired enough, that the that new growth, unplanned growth is determining the route of the railway. And that seems to me both undemocratic and, and I don't, you know, it just seems to me the, the wrong way, it's not an engineer's way to design a railway. It, ends up with this rather meandering route rather than a more direct route. So look, we're, you know, um, we're, we're clear that, you know, government is asking us to uh, develop and build this railway um, because it is an enabler, um, you know, and a support for you know, the, the wider growth as part of the Oxford Cambridge arc. Um, what we are tasked with doing is developing recommendations uh, on what the right railway uh, to build is, taking into account a set of 15 assessment factors um, that we have agreed with government that they want us to take into account. 
we are doing that. Um, those 15 assessment factors are set out, one of which is the um, one of which is the you know uh, availability of um, you know land for development, um, but it is there are other factors that we're also taking into account. You know the environment is obviously very important in that. The wider economic growth of the arc is very uh, of the of the local area is very important in that, and so therefore you know it you know that you know that availability of land for development is is one factor. But there are 14 others that we're taking into account as well. Um, but you know, it is the case that East West Rail is an enabler, you know, one of the enablers of the of, of the wider growth that you know, the National Infrastructure Commission identified, and that is confirmed in the National Infrastructure Strategy. So, so that 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 is where we are, and we're we're doing our best. To apply the fifteen assessment factors that we've agreed with government, because that's the you know that's the set of criteria that we're looking at. So, have you actually been told to provide an additional station in the A1 corridor? Then, so we're so there is likely there, there will be a station you know approximate to the east coast main line. Mm, right. I mean, this is a question that is relevant to. Ravenston, my parish, which I represent, because of the one of the developers uh, uh, outlined schemes at Twinwoods um, promotes a, a you know potential an opportunity for a, well potential opportunity for a station. So you know um, additional stations on route are, are a concern. But uh, and, and look, you know, I'm you know, I think I've been clear. You know, a station between. Uh, Bedford and uh, the East Coast Main Line is absolutely not in our scope. We haven't been asked by government to look at it. Um, and with all of these things, the thing that you have to take into account is that, you know, it is important that we provide connectivity. So that's why you know, stations at places like the East Coast Main Line at Camborne, you know, at Bedford, and you know, along the Marston Vale line are important, so that people. It, this isn't just a railway um, that, a bit like High Speed Two, goes between two places a long way away and doesn't connect communities in between. This does. You know, we are aiming to be a, a railway that connects communities, um, but um, you at the same time have can't you can't have too many stations because otherwise it does slow the journey down too much. And that undermines the overall benefit of the scheme. And it's trying to find the right balance on that. That is the balance we think we found. And that doesn't include a station between Bedford and the East Coast Main Line. Yeah, thank you. That is reassuring. It's just to my mind, if as I say, if the budget overruns, how will that how how will any shortfall be be found? And um, you know, that's what concerns me because I just feel that the uh, developer contribution will be you know what what will be looked for rather than government funding as, as i say i think you know um that you know that's to, that's sort of to speculate on what on what might happen but sort of in in my experience the level of developer contributions um you know around particular stations don't tend to go much beyond the cost of a particular station as opposed to you know covering why the budget overrun so I, I i don't think that's the scenario in which it would happen um right. you know, just just to provide you some reassurance yeah thank you very much thanks brilliant uh, so with that point and mindful that we've overrun by quite a lot but i hope that people who have been able to stay have found uh, that uh, useful although apologies uh for for the kind of delay the extra time uh, we live, if you wouldn't mind, draw us to a close. Yeah, no, I think really just to say thank you very much for your questions. We have we have tried to answer as honestly and openly and openly as we can. Um, I know in some areas where we don't have as much information as you would like, that is frustrating, but we are doing our best to provide the information that we do have available to us. Um, and you know, there is that, that trade-off, as I said, between consulting earlier and not having all the information that people will want you know, at that point in time. But where we have information, we're trying to make it available. Um, 
I recognize that both you and uh, your, your residents may well have more questions. We do have these live chat events, uh, five more over the next uh, two weeks, uh, and there will be the opportunity to ask our, our experts directly at, at that point. So do please um, attend those and encourage your local residents to attend those. And if you do have further questions, don't hesitate to get in touch you know, contact at eastwestrail.co.uk or by giving us a call, you know, on, on the number there. But in the meantime, thank you very much for your time today. Um, and we look forward to a sort of an ongoing conversation with you. Uh, thanks very much. And I'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a good evening. Thank you.